Mr. Secretary, as you know, uh, we, we have a, a number of administration officials uh, before this committee hearing uh, coming here tomorrow uh, to do, we're going to have an in-depth uh, conversation about our challenges uh, at the southwest border with a number of experts who are, who are on the front lines. And part of that discussion will include uh, the department's plans uh, for the termination of uh, Title 42. Once uh, Title 42 is terminated, Border Patrol needs to return to border inf security enforcement strategies, such as the consequence uh, delivery system, which uh, has been severely limited as, uh, from this health order. Uh, before there were consequences for coming across illegally. Now folks are just returned back and they keep coming over and over again because of the way Title 42 works, why we see a, a surge here. These are people that keep trying, we keep stopping them, we keep sending them back, but they keep coming over and over again. So my question for you is, how is the department preparing to, to resource efforts to lean into consequences uh, like the expedited removal and the uh, prosecution to limit the number of individuals crossing the border illegally, as well as limit this, these high rates of recidivism that we're seeing as a result of uh, Title 42? Mr. Chairman, if I could take a step back. Uh, Title 42, the CDC's authority calls for an expulsion of an individual, which means that the individual is not placed into immigration removal proceedings and therefore does not have an enforcement record established by the attempted illegal entry. And so we are seeing a great um, deal of recidivism. So the number of encounters uh, doesn't necessarily reflect and does not, in fact, reflect the number of unique individuals whom we encounter, but rather we see the same individual trying repeated attempts to enter in between the ports of entry. What we are doing is surging personnel, uh, both at U.S. Customs and Border Protection, specifically the Border Patrol, as well as enforcement and removal operations within Immigration and Customs Enforcement to bring expedited removal, that's immigration enforcement proceedings, um, to the fullest extent that we can as well as working with the Department of Justice, the United States attorneys in the jurisdictions along the border to address conduct through criminal prosecution that warrants it. Uh, in, in recent years, uh, with uh, high arrivals of uh, unaccompanied minors, uh, we saw children spending, unfortunately, significant amount of time in CBP facilities in, instead of uh, HHS facilities. I think due in large part just to the, the lack of uh, appropriate planning uh, in years past. Mr. Secretary, how, how are you ensuring uh, that the DHS and HHS are cooperating across the departments to make sure resources can be quickly act activated to protect these vulnerable uh, children uh, if a similar situation occurs? Mr. Chairman, the, the law provides that unaccompanied children uh, in the uh, care of U.S. Customs and Border Protection must be turned over to the Department of Health and Human Services within 72 hours. When we saw those Border Patrol stations uh, become overcrowded early in 2021, that was by reason of a challenge in what throughput. Um, that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services did not have the resources uh, to actually receive and shelter the unaccompanied children. We, in the Department of Homeland Security, dedicated tremendous resources to assist the Department of Health and Human Services, and we also brought expertise to re-engineer the process, and so we built a more efficient and agile process to move children from Border Patrol stations to HHS to Department of Health and Human uh, Services shelters, and then added great efficiency to ensure that those children could be united as the law provides with qualified family members here in the United States who would sponsor them. And that work, collaborative work and relationship, of course, has not waned in the ensuing months. There, there's no doubt that the uh, department's effort to respond to security and humanitarian needs at the southern border are going to require significant uh, resources uh, in, the, in the days and months ahead. Are, are you preparing to submit a supplemental funding request to Congress to, to address some of these needs? Mr. Chairman, we're very grateful to Congress for the appropriation that we received in fiscal year 22 in this current fiscal year. And we, of course, have submitted a spending plan with respect to how we are using those funds. We believe it is um, 
a matter of fiscal responsibility for us um, after those funds uh, are expended uh, to first look within the department and where we can reprogram funds as necessary. Uh, if indeed um, we need uh, to seek a supplemental uh, from Congress, we will certainly communicate that uh, with this committee forthwith. Mr. Secretary, we are facing supply chain bottlenecks um, and, and a busy uh, summer travel season and the need to make sure our ports of entry across the country are functioning uh, as efficiently as possible. And so, you know, if I look at the past, uh, we, we've unfortunately seen DHS personnel pulled from northern border uh, and airports to support what's happening uh, at the southern border. So my question to you, sir, is what actions is the administration taking to ensure that ports of entry around the country, including the northern border, are properly resourced? Mr. Chairman, we're very mindful of the ports of entry as, a, as a, an engine of economic prosperity, the movement, the lawful movement of of people and goods, a promotion of trade and travel, and we deploy our personnel, if needed, to a different area according uh, to the needs of the ports of entry. We do not sacrifice those needs to serve others. We um, know how to move our personnel and resources around so that we achieve all aspects of our mission ably, as our people are extraordinarily talented in doing. Mr. Secretary, this year's uh, budget request for CISA is uh, lower than what was appropriated uh, last year. CISA is still growing, and Congress uh, has provided, as you know, and uh, have been helpful, uh, in an extensive new authorities to the agency. Incident reporting, uh, running the .gov domain, supporting K-12 cyber, a joint cyber planning office, and we in Congress are now working to uh, update uh, FISMA. Could you explain to the committee why the budget request is lower than what Congress uh, appropriated, and what do you feel is an appropriate growth trajectory for CISA? Um, Mr. Chairman, we're very grateful for the budget that was enacted for fiscal year 2022. Uh, the, the amount that we dedicated in the fiscal year 2023 budget for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is actually considerably more than the budget that we proposed for fiscal year 2022. It's a matter of timing. We were unaware uh, that Congress uh, would so amply uh, fund uh, CISA. Uh, and so it's really a matter of timing, but we continue to grow uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and we actually have the $650 million uh, in funds from uh, the other source. And so we are growing it as quickly as we can um, efficiently absorb the funds and grow the organization uh, to ensure its uh, quality and growth to meet the challenges that we confront. Right. Well, I appreciate that. We've had numerous conversations about this. I appreciate your passion uh, about defending uh, our country from these uh, cyber attacks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I want to start off by first uh, thanking you uh, for your support on uh, ranking Portman and my incident reporting uh, legislation. Uh, I'm happy we were able to get that passed into law, and, and now, as you know, CISA has begun the, uh, the rulemaking process. So my question for you, sir, is does uh, this budget request include enough funding to ensure that the rulemaking is going to occur both thoroughly and, uh, and quickly? Certainly attacks are happening today. We need to get this information. We need to get this rule passed as quickly as possible. Could you give me an update on your thoughts as to how quickly we can move this forward? So, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Portman, I want to thank you both for uh, championing this critical, critical piece of legislation. It's going to make a significant difference in the cybersecurity of our country. We are already uh, working um, uh, to uh, implement the legislation. We anticipate uh, promulgating a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, the implementing uh, regulation. Uh, for the statute uh, that you uh, both and others, of course, uh, championed. Uh, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is working with FEMA uh, to develop um, the notice of proposed rulemaking, and we've already begun uh, to confer with members of the private sector to understand some of their of the critical issues uh, that they have to make sure that the statute's objectives are ably met. Right. Well, thank you. You know, every year uh, more applicants apply for disaster mitigation assistance than, uh, than we have available uh, funding. 
but yet we know that mitigation uh, projects uh, saves both lives uh, and money. In fact, every dollar of federal money that we spend on mitigation before a disaster saves uh, on average uh, $6. Just common sense if we're prepared uh, before a storm, we're gonna be a lot better off than picking up all the pieces uh, after the storm. Uh, that's why I authored, uh, I authored the STORM Act, which has been signed into law. We've already provided funding for it, which is going to help states set up a revolving loan fund for hazard mitigation projects. Initial funding for that program was in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. My question for you, Mr. Secretary, is um, uh, DHS provides this uh, vital funding to mitigate the risk of natural hazards and improve nation's re uh, resilience. Uh, can I have your commitment uh, that both the DHS and FEMA will work uh, with my staff to fully implement the STORM Act program as quickly as possible so that we can have our local communities uh, engage in these uh, mitigation projects uh, as quickly as possible? Yes, I will, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the STORM Act is really going to make an impact as well. Uh, I concur with your assessment of the importance of mitigation, and um, I know the STORM Act uh, enables uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, through FEMA uh, to work um, with uh, tribal uh, and state governments to make capitalization grants uh, with that goal in mind. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the Arab American uh, community in my home state of Michigan has uh, long endured lengthy and intrusive screening uh, when traveling, uh, which certainly deeply affects uh, people's families, it affects their businesses, and even their ability to enjoy family vacations uh, that many take uh, for, for granted. Uh, I know you heard uh, directly uh, from uh, the Arab American community in Michigan when you were with me there. Thank you for making uh, that trip and uh, you heard uh, that message loud and clear. My question for you is that President Biden pledged that the Department of Homeland Security would review the use of the terrorist watch list and the no-fly list while on the campaign trail. Can you pr provide an update on the progress of, uh, of your review and when you expect changes uh, to be implemented? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will have to um, get back uh, to you on that. I know that work is underway. I'm certainly following our trip uh, uh, to your state of Michigan. Um, I followed up on what I heard. Uh, as you well know, you made the announcement with respect to the designation of a community relations officer, but the status of a review of the watch list, uh, the no-fly list, and the redress uh, avenues is something I would have to look into. I right. don't well, know right now. Well, I appreciate your commitment to do that. I know you're working on it. We'll look forward to working closely with you in the, in the weeks and months ahead.